I've often quoted as saying I would rather be governed by the first 2,000 people in the Boston Telephone Directory than by the 2,000 people on the faculty of Harvard University. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. They share our beliefs, our convictions, our hopes, and our dreams. These are the conservatives of the heart. They are our people. Join the best in the movement. It's Conservative Conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Johnny and James. Today, we're joined by ISI alumnus, journalist, author, and mom, Gracie Olmstead, to talk about her new book, Uprooted. Thanks for joining us, Gracie. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to get to talk to you guys. So, Gracie, before we get to our listener question, I wanted to just take a minute to highlight the fact that this year you are being awarded one of our top 20 under 30 alumni awards at our inaugural homecoming event. So uh, June 25th and 26th this summer. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your ISI experience. Absolutely. Well, I first heard about ISI and began reading ISI books while I was still a college student. And when I graduated from college, was still trying to get my foot in the door with a publication in Washington, D.C. And the Collegiate Network fellowships put together by ISI enabled me to work for the American Conservative straight out of college. And thankfully, they hired me after my internship ended. And so that kind of launched my career in the D.C. journalism world and enabled everything that has followed to happen But um, I obviously wouldn't have been able to do any of that if not for their support, both financial and in the form of various intellectual thinkers that they've uh, you guys have exposed me to over the the years. And so um, I've been a very huge fan and uh, very thankful for ISI since 2013 at the latest, but obviously before then as well. (laughs) And I should add that when I was actually at ISI and in James age, I was, you know, working in development, but I would in the ISI mail room, get copies of the American conservative. And I was an avid reader of Gracie Olmstead, who was at TAC at that time. And uh, I I have to give you some of the credit for luring me away from ISI the first time, but I'm happy, happy to be back and happy that uh, you're now famous and have a book and you're one of our most celebrated alumni. Uh, So (laughs) congrats, Gracie. And uh, if you would like to see Gracie get the uh, award uh, for the top alumni under 30, you can join us at Homecoming this summer. It's the last weekend of June, June 25th and June 26th. Uh, Friday night, we'll have an amazing presentation from Yuval Levin of AEI, who's winning the Conservative Book of the Year Award. Uh, And we're also giving away the uh, top alumni awards that evening. So just click in the show notes, or if you're watching live, Click the link in the chat and you can get your tickets today. Awesome. So this week's listener question is from Josh. And Josh asks, who are the top three authors that have influenced your thinking? So Gracie, why don't you go first today? Uh, Wendell Berry is obvious, but I I still have to say Wendell Berry is one of my top three. Um, his books and work have shaped my own in ways that are impossible to measure and I would not have written my book if not for him. Uh, also, Marilyn Robinson would be on that list for me. I think her deep imagination and attentiveness to uh, the beauties and the differences between human persons has just continued to inspire me in countless ways. Both her Gilead trilogy and her book, Housekeeping, are some of my favorite books I've ever read. And then John Steinbeck would also be on that list. I love everything he's written, um, but obviously The Grapes of Wrath and East of Eden are two works uh, that are both novels and and pieces of place that I think are fascinating and and really important to consider. That's fantastic. What about you, James? Do you have three... uh... Three ready to on the tip of the tongue? Yeah, you know, I think I would say it, um, St. Augustine for sure. Um, and then in a sort of in this literary realm, uh, Graham Greene and then uh, Russell Kirk, of course. I mean, those who know me know that Kirk is uh, Kirk's a big deal for me and uh, really sort of brought me to conservatism, I think. And you, Johnny? Um, yeah, it's a tough question. I'm just I'm just thinking of it uh, now. I would say. 
you know, in terms of theology, there's this Eastern Orthodox uh, theologian, Alexander Schmemann, who I would say was pretty influential for my understanding of uh, liturgy and worship. Um, there's an American poet, uh, contemporary poet named B.H. Fairchild, um, who combines sort of Aristotelian philosophy with kind of just blue collar, uh, Great Plains and sort of Midwestern grit and uh, has a lot of compelling poems about kind of factory life out in the heartland. Uh, and he is uh, he was a frequent visitor uh, at Hillsdale. And he's sort of one of my favorites. Um, so, yeah, we'll leave it. A Alexander Hamilton, Washington, kind of some of the classic American founders if we're talking political philosophy. But we'll leave it there. Great. Well, if you'd like to submit a question for our next episode, just leave a review in the show wherever you're listening. And uh, we'll pick one uh, for next time. Um, so, Gracie, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, uh, besides your own book, what books are you uh, personally reading now? I feel like it's it's kind of funny with books because I can imagine like there were all these books that really influenced your own writing when you put this together. But now that's probably been like two years ago. So you're probably like at a whole new level in terms of new things you're discovering. So what's what have you been up to in terms of your reading lately? I'm trying to read way too much at once, which tends to be my struggle in general. Now that I have a four month old, my ability to read is oftentimes cut short. Um, but I've been reading uh, Landmarks by Robert McFarlane, which is a fascinating and beautiful book. Um, James Rebank's new book, Pastoral Song, which uh, I have a copy of. I'm hoping to do something about it for the Front Porch Republic at some point, so stay tuned. I've also just been reading through The Lord of the Rings again because it's been quite some time and I absolutely love The Lord of the Rings. And so that's been really fun to listen to, actually. And um, let's see, I've been reading a book that's called Up to Heaven and Down to Hell. That's about fracking and property rights. And it's absolutely fascinating. And I'm hoping to write a review of that one, too, if I have time. <laughs> but it's been really fun to listen to um, and to read. And I think there's one more that I might be forgetting, but th those are a few highlights, I guess. <laughs> and Gracie, are you like, do you, I imagine you said you have a four month old, like, do you listen to mostly audiobooks right now? Or are you read like legitimately reading or do you kind of do a combination of, of the two? I do a combo. So I have certain books that I'll listen to while I do dishes or clean or um, I'm in the car and then I have some books I prefer to, um, if I've read a book before, I love to re-listen to it via an audiobook. but I really love having a physical copy in my hands. Cause I'm one of those people who just writes all over a book, writes in the margins, dog ears, pages, um, covers it with notes, which I know annoys some people to no end, but I have an extremely visual memory. And so I can usually call back up in my mind the pages I've read if I have a physical copy. So that's that's what I prefer, especially on a first reading of something. What about you? You know, I think it's mostly just, you know, out of uh, time constraints, I've just kind of been binging audiobooks as of late. It's, it's sort of easier with biographies than it is with fiction. Um, so yeah, I've been on the audiobook train, although I'm, I am, uh, you know, I sort of long for just being able to sit down for like 90 minutes and read, but I don't quite have that luxury right now. So great. Well, uh, before we get on to the formal interview, so we can hear a little bit more about your book, Uprooted, I'd just like to thank everyone listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. Uh, this product is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and our mission at ISI is to educate for liberty. So if you'd like to help us pursue that mission, Please rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more listeners like yourself. Uh, now let's get on to the interview. James? So, Gracie, I wonder if we could just start with kind of an overview of what your project was in Uprooted. What what sort of drew you to writing on um, localism and farming in the first place? I know you've been doing it for a while, but sort of what, how how did you get here to writing Uprooted? Well, I started reading Wendell Berry's works in college. And uh, the first book I read by him is called Remembering. It's a novella about 150 pages. 
And it's about a young person who leaves his homeland behind in order to become a journalist. And uh, he begins writing about agriculture and feels called home. And when I read Remembering, it felt like a punch in the gut because it was describing many of my own ambitions at the time and my own journey away from the farm community where I grew up. And uh, I had already at that time begun to feel just some stirrings of homesickness in my own heart and begin to realize kind of what I left behind and why it mattered. I grew up in a farm community that was extremely close. Uh, the rhythms of interdependence and love and community and neighborliness were still very strong, even though it is a community that's experienced severe hollowing out as the region and much of rural America as a whole have suffered from brain drain and other things um, like the concentration of agriculture. And so I was realizing how beautiful that community was and how in many ways I would not have been able to achieve anything I had been able to achieve as a young person, if not for my forebears and the way that they worked so hard to root themselves in that community, to love it well, and to build the social capital that then enabled me to succeed. And so in reading Wendell Berry's work and in seeing the plight of that community that I'd left behind, I began to feel both those stirrings of homesickness and a desire to do something to perhaps give back, to highlight the importance of that community, the beauty that was there, and to do something in thanks and in gratitude for it. Um, something I talk about in my book is that my great grandfather once grew a crop of sweet corn just to give it away. He wanted to do something to give back to the people he loved, both his neighbors, his church members, and his family. And so he would grow this sweet corn and then he would harvest it and he would give it to us. And so I liked to call that crop his first fruits crop. And I came to think of this project as, in a very small, meager way in comparison, something that I could offer as a first fruits crop back to my own community. That's fascinating. And Gracie, you, you talk about, you know, when you're writing this book, you went back, you interviewed some students at the local school, and there was a sense, even among the, the younger students, that it was really important to have big plans. And that sort of reminded me of something that Bill Kaufman um, often talks about, which is, you know, you sort of, when you're referring to young, young kids you know, in school, if you're a parent, you're watching your kids play baseball or something, you know, it's common to say, oh, that kid's going to go far someday. And it's kind of implied in the language, this sort of transitory nature of if you're successful, you're gone, you know, and if you're a loser, you're going to stay, stay back home. Um, like, where do you think that comes from? And how do these young kids have that ingrained in their, you know, in their system at, at such a young age? I would argue the American dream itself is kind of predicated on very transitory language. And um, we've always kind of emphasized the fact that climbing the economic ladder generally involves mobility of some sort. Usually mobility is how we track uh, people's ability to move from poverty to wealth, um, which I think in many ways is, is a sad indicator of how poorly we've done at enabling communities to grow good, strong um, roots in the places where people actually live, that in order to actually succeed in life, you generally have to leave place behind. At the same time, I think there was probably, uh, well, there's definitely been some times throughout American history and some communities and regions in which sticking, staying in place was seen as a positive thing. But I think as time has gone on, those cultural voices that say that in order to succeed, you do need to go far, I think, have just gotten louder and more prominent, perhaps. And so even though I've tried to point out to people, there are good reasons to leave home behind in many instances, but you never hear the reasons for staying. And so I really wanted to write something that focused on what are those reasons and, and why don't we take them into account more often than we do. Gracie, you used the word sticker. And it's sort of, it reminded me of the boomer sticker um, dichotomy that you talk about in the book, which I think you get from Wallace Stegner. Is that right? Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. In his book, uh, Where the Bluebird Sings to the Lemonade Springs, which is a collection of essays, Wallace Stegner talks about these two populations, the boomers and the stickers, which he argues have kind of torn apart and rebuilt uh, American communities over time 
the boomers are those who go into a place and kind of deplete its natural resources and then leave it behind. He referred to them also as pillagers, um, those who are pillagers or who work for pillagers. And then the stickers are those who go into a neighborhood or a town or a community and they invest. They intend to stay and build something not just for themselves, but for the next generation. And so their attitude toward place is not one of extraction or explo exploitation, but rather one in which they want to grow and steward and love that place well. So one, one, I'm wondering what role civil society plays in that and how, you know, does civil society just sort of get trashed by that and kind of thrown to the wayside or could civil society maybe, you know, institutions, local institutions, could they maybe kind of help bear the burden of some of that boom and bust cycle? Mm. I think that's a really important point. One of the things that I saw as I researched my book and wanted to point out is that in many instances, people's ability to stay in place was built through community, through local associations and through local neighbors. Uh, because in many times and places, especially if you're dealing with poor populations, um, it's very hard to stick. People don't have the resources to stick and to build a business mm -hmm. And in my great grandfather's case, he was trying to start farming during the Great Depression. It would have been impossible for him to have accomplished that if not for his neighbors and his local church. Um, it was interesting as I was researching the book, story after story came out about um, how he was able to rent land because one of his neighbors, who was also his great grandfather, was able to set up a sharecropping arrangement with him. Uh, he was given a team of horses in payment because the farmer didn't actually have money to pay him for his labor, but he gave him a team of horses instead. He found boards to build a fence that someone had thrown away. Another farmer gave him a few milk cows because he also couldn't pay my great grandfather for his labor. And he just kind of patched together a farm from the things that people gave him, from the things that people rented him, from the things that people threw away. And then through the local church and through local associations began to build a life and a community. Um, but he would not have been able to stick or to build a farm if not for those people. He didn't have the resources. He didn't have the capital. Um, but those people became his resources and gave him what he needed to get his start. And so I think in many communities, the ability to survive through extremely hard times is built on those associations, those neighbors, and that sense of membership that we are here for each other. And we're building something not as atomized individuals, but as a collective working together. I guess one of the questions that I'm thinking of now is um, to go back. So we've, we've talked a little bit about civil society and to go back to the American dream point, it's it's really is a sort of interesting dichotomy there between the the point you made about the American dream, where the, which is that it's sort of necessarily this way it sort of necessarily chases and is is transitory um but then also uh, civil society is is kind of a particularly american thing as well and so i'm wondering in what sense the american uh dream or american culture is necessarily transitory or what might have caused it to become that way or sort of where this where this yeah i mean does that make sense yeah definitely um so in democracy in america alexis de tocqueville i think pretty well demonstrates in my mind that these have been two kind of tensions in American life for a very long time. He both talks about the American individual and how um, the American person likes to see their fate forever in their own hands and has a very self-sufficient, um, almost maverick sensibility uh, that we will achieve what we want to achieve by ourselves, completely disconnected from others. And yet at the same time has this habit of neighborliness that means that um, communities are constantly seeking to serve each other in local institutions and associations in the fabric of everyday life. And he argued that um, Americans have this constant habit of benevolence in his terms that I think is completely different from or at least competing against those very individualistic tendencies. And yet the two, I think, can work together in some really interesting ways. It's good that the one tempers the other, at least. Um, but I think that perhaps because of the way that these two have existed for at least the last couple of hundred years, um, they are always there together. And I would argue that um, 
the individualistic mindset, the the American dream that is very transitory is always going to be warring against the habits of community, which is, of course, why the associations are so important, because they almost force us into that constant habit of benevolence and um, force us to perhaps temper our individualistic maverick tendencies. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, on that point, I think it's kind of interesting see, thinking through like what, you know, what comes first, like the chicken or the egg, because I think about this, this is something that we talked a little bit about with Tim Carney when he was here about his book, Alienated America. Um, you know, if you think of many of the institutions of civil society, the churches, you know, if you think of the, I'm about 20 minutes south of the steel town, Coatesville, which used to be called the Pittsburgh of the East. And, you know, you have a Russian church, a Polish church, a Ukrainian church. And, um, you know, I, from time to time, go up for liturgy at those parishes. But it's it's very clear, you know, and I I love attending the services there, but it's very much clear that those places, they were the the institutions of civil society were part of the boom. You know, the only reason there's a Polish or Russian or Ukrainian church is because there was some, you know, new industry that was there. So you had people come over from Europe and they, you know, immigrated and they started their life together and all these institutions popped up. But then when the boom stopped, civil society has kind of perpetually been in this position of decline. Um, so I guess I'm curious, kind of, what do you, uh, I know you, you've been thinking a little bit about economics and industrial agriculture and how that's impacted um, civil society and community. What do you think about, tell, talk a little bit about your thoughts and the relationships between economics and uh, civil society and rootedness and what conclusions you've come to throughout writing your book? Oh my goodness. S such a good um, question. I, I have noticed that in this particular farm town that I write about in the book, um, the three strands of, you know, the individual farms and what they accomplished, civil society, the associations, the churches in the farm town itself, and then the local agribusinesses that undergirded that community were all inextricably part of each other and served each other in different ways. Um, and all three have then also kind of declined, concentrated, um, gone out of business. Uh, the churches have aged as the community itself has aged uh, together. And so once again, it's kind of that chicken or egg problem in terms of figuring out what happened first. And obviously, I think the associations and the churches have struggled in response to the struggles of businesses and, and jobs overall. Um, farmers, uh, in many instances, are remaining, but their struggles, of course, are now that in order to sell their product, in order to um, get their tractors fixed, um, in order to do all these things that normally would have been local, they now have to commute. And that puts an extra burden of expenses on their businesses. So. Um, yeah, it is interesting to see how as the farm town becomes less and less of a farm town, all those strands of commerce that kind of tied people together um, ebb away. And, and with that, I think you also see those strands of cultural continuity and love and, and support that used to exist struggling to remain as well. Um, as to whether the local associations can bring those things back without the local jobs, without that sense of this is our shared purpose and our thing we do together. I'm very curious uh, what you build that sense of purpose and identity around without without the farm town remaining a farm town. I'm sure it's possible, but I, I don't yet have all the answers on how you do that. <laughs> Gracie, you know, I, I wanna sort of pivot toward uh, farming in particular. You know, one of the things you talk about, obviously, is an industrial farming. And I'm wondering, from your perspective, where did agriculture kind of go wrong? Where did it have a misstep that's led to um, the state that it's in now? That's a really big question. <laughs> I don't know if I'm necessarily qualified to answer that question. Um but I can tell you kind of what I found as I as I worked on the book and, and what conclusions it's tentatively led me toward um, in terms of how agriculture has changed over the last couple hundred years. Um, you definitely see a pattern 
emerging at the beginning of the, or I would say probably late 1800s, early 1900s of um, industrialization, mechanization with new technologies coming out. But I think what was happening more during that time was also that there was this messaging happening within the U.S. Department of Agriculture and, and the larger culture around farming that no longer emphasized growing things for one's community or region, and that was emphasizing um, agriculture more as a, a weapon of, of global diplomacy and trade as something that was very much tied to our relations with the larger world, um, it, which is in many ways a good thing, but it definitely changed the nature of how farms produced and in what quantity they produced those things. Um, so, for instance, in the 1900s, early 1900s, um, farmers responded to World War I by growing a glut of grain um, that had some ecological damage that resulted in the Dust Bowl, which a lot of people are familiar with. Um, but when that resulted in a massive downturn and in the environmental damage of the Dust Bowl, we didn't necessarily pull back or start growing less. And indeed, into World War II, the language in the USDA surrounding agriculture was that farmers were no longer um, local producers working for their own communities, but rather cogs in this giant economic machine. And um, even that language of a machine, which is in and of itself, as John Steinbeck points out, a dead thing, not a living thing uh, in the barn. I think something was changing in how we viewed agriculture, whether we viewed it as something that was more mechanistic or something that happens in the living earth and that is meant to, of course, yes, also serve a larger community um, in, in the world as a whole, but also traditionally speaking would have served the farm family in growing what they needed to eat and the, the region, the county, the town surrounding that, that family. Um, and so it's interesting to kind of see that trajectory and those trends and then how that began to change, how and what farmers grew. Back in the day, you would have seen smaller farms in which they would have grown a diversity of crops because generally that is a way of building resilience into your business model. And you would have seen farms generally um, hosting a variety of animals that, that had different jobs that they did for the farm family. Um, but as we emphasized, once again, this this larger model, uh, you see a lot of homogenization, loss of diversification in the farm to the extent where today, uh, when you go to the heartland or, or to these various uh, towns and communities where farming is common, most people grow one thing um, or two things. Uh, corn and soybeans would be would be to the most common ones in a lot of the the Midwest in Idaho. Um, we, of course, always get talked uh, about potatoes uh, as, as one of the things, but the, that was grown down more south uh, where I grew up. Uh, farmers grew mint uh, as a commodity crop, actually. Uh, there's lots of alfalfa. There's lots of seed farming, actually, um, and other, other forms of agriculture. Uh, dairies are extremely common as well in Idaho and a huge part of its, its output. So, um, but dairies, of course, would have been one of those operations that once was integrated with other things, whereas now it's, it's much, very much something you do in and of itself, by itself. And so um, one of the things I try to highlight in the book is that when you lose that diverse, um, just bevy of things that the farm produces, you also tend to lose health. Um, farmers that are monocropping don't have healthy soil. Animals that are in a concentrated animal feeding operation are not as healthy as the ones that are out on pasture. And so in these ways that we've concentrated to such a degree that we've lost diversity, we've also lost health. Before we move on to our next question, I just wanted to give you a brief message from a friend of ISI, the Conservative Minds podcast. What does it mean to call yourself a conservative? Where did the conservative movement come from and where is it going? In a time of ideological realignment and uncertainty where social media sniping replaces measured discourse and debate, people are left to wonder, which values and ideas define American conservatism? On the Conservative Minds podcast, join Corey Astell and Kyle Salmon as they answer these questions and more by reading political authors from the past and present and discussing them in a fast-paced, free-flowing conversation. To listen, go to conservativeminds.fireside.fm or find it on your regular podcast provider. All right, let's get back to the interview. And 
sort of, uh, you know, going a, a little further with that point, it's, it's hard to figure out exactly, um, you know, I'm, I'm tracking with your analysis and I largely, uh, you know, I'm sympathetic to it. I, I guess the thing that I'm trying to figure out is how do you, what does it take to really course correct? You know, cause I know some, some corn and soybean farmers, for example, out in Nebraska, you know, friends of mine and, um, you know, I, they've, um, you know, they, they certainly would have read Wendell Berry. They're, they're sort of familiar, I think, with the kind of the canon of more humane literature and, and writing. But that doesn't necessarily change the fact that they, you know, they have a farm and they've got a thousand acres and they have to grow corn and soybeans. And so I don't, what is, um, you know, obviously there might be a role for public policy, but how does, you know, as an individual farmer, like, are there viable ways that you could actually kind of pivot? Um I don't know. Have you explored, have you encountered people who've come to this epiphany and said, you know, like we need to do something different and have been able to make it work economically? Or is it kind of like you're in a car going 70 miles an hour on the freeway and you just kind of have to drive it because if you jump out of it, it's not going to work out too well for you? I, there's definitely people who have. Um, the struggle is always that there's a lot of financial difficulty associated with that change. Um, Gabe Brown has argued in his work, and I think very um, persuasively, that the model of agriculture that we see now, where you're growing one or two things and never growing a more diverse array of things, um, actually has a lot of costs that can result in a farm's eventual collapse. And that actually that move to a more diverse model is one that is going to result in profit down the road. It just takes time to get there. So the question is, how do you how do you get from point A to, in many ways, point Z, right? Um, and I think it has to be incremental. Uh, this is this is one of those instances in which, um, because it involves people's livelihoods and their land, I, I do think it's going to be hard to do all at once, and probably won't be successful if you try to do it all at once. But we have lots of farmers working to start by no-till, you know, just not tilling the soil and changing their rhythm so that they're not just breaking up that that soil every year. And then they're introducing one or two cover crops, and they're starting to add that to the way that they work on their farm. And then maybe they have a, a local farmer who has cattle come and graze those cover crops before they go in and, and plant their corn. Now they're they've done three things that already are restoring soil that was that was struggling. And those three things over time are going to build back health. It could you could do more, but even just by doing those three things, you're starting to do something really important. Anytime you're trying to do something on a thousand acres, that's a lot of land. And so I think one of the biggest challenges is that we've built a model that relied on quantity in order to be profitable. And now trying to build quality back into that quantity is going to be a struggle just because doing what I just described on 500 acres would be way easier than doing it on a thousand. Building intensity and a lot of different uses and density back into a thousand acres is always going to be difficult and expensive. And so um, maybe that's a, a realm where public policy would be able to come in and help people. Maybe some farmers will have to sell some acres in order to just do better with what they have, um, which in my mind actually would not be a horrible thing, especially if that land can go to someone who also wants to farm as opposed to, you know, into a development or or the next strip mall in rural America. <laughs> yeah, it, well, and I mean, I think I, I had looked up um, a while back just how what are the profits on corn, for example, per acre. And it's like $740 an acre, right, in profit, which is not a lot. I mean, if you think about how much land an acre is, right, it's, you have, five, let's say, let's say it's 750 an acre and you have 500 acres, like you're making 350,000 a year in profit, but you, you know, you have the cost of seed, you have like a hundred thousand dollar combine that you're driving. You've got, I mean, it's sort of a, uh, one, it seems like it would be almost impossible to just get into farming at that scale if you had a passion for it. You kind of have to inherit a farm in order to be able to afford afford it. But it just seems like then if you're only getting 750 an acre, then to be asked to take a year off to let it kind of lay 
fallow and have other things. I mean, that's a big, a pretty big ask given the the crunch. And then if, you know, if there's a subdivision that could move in, you know, and you could get way more than 700, you know, do you could do the math and probably it would make a lot of sense just to turn it into a strip mall. Um, so I do think that, yeah, there's probably a lot of economic pressure on people in that type of situation. Yeah, I think so. And one of the big arguments, which I think is is a very important one in our time, is that the only people who can farm are people who are farming with money, not for money. Um, how can we change that? How can we make it so that people who have a really strong desire to grow food for their communities are enabled to do so? How can we make it so that the costs of starting a farm, of procuring that land, aren't so far beyond their means that they're never able to see that dream realized? And um, that's a problem I think we're going to be grappling with for quite a long time. Yeah. Gracie, one of the this you know one of the things that struck me when I was reading this book was how personal it was um, for you when you're sort of talking about leaving Idaho and living in Virginia and sort of feeling that tug in both directions. Um, I I would you know hazard a guess that there are a lot of college students who are ISI students right now who sort of feel maybe a similar tension. So I wonder you know could you sort of offer any you know words of wisdom for students who are thinking about this this exact tension in their own lives. Absolutely. Um, one of the titles we thought about for the book was actually Greener Pastures, uh, which kind of captures something that Wendell Berry talks about in his book. Uh, I think I, I'm actually forgetting which one it is now. It's not Hannah Coulter, um, but it's one of his books about one of his novels about the Coulters as a family. And um, in it, one of the, the protagonist's uncles tells him that the mountains always look blue in the far off distance. But then when you get there, you realize that the mountains you came from also have that beautiful, longing, blue look to them. And he says to this young man, I guess someone could wear himself out going back and forth. And um, something I realized very early on is that there's perhaps just as a result of being human, this sense of discontent we can have around being a part of a place and um, a, a desire to always be looking for those greener pastures, for those bluer mountains off on the horizon. And so something I really wanted to do with this book is to consider that every place we live in is going to have its imperfections. And I wanted to look back at the place I came from and not do so just with nostalgia, but to hopefully give a very thorough, critical, as well as loving look at what had made it into a place. Um, and then to consider, because it would be very easy to move back with sort of a rose colored glasses and not truly be seeing it for what it was or is. Um, and yet, even as I live in Northern Virginia, that sort of loving gaze that's both critical and forgiving and compassionate is, is important here as well. And so one thing I guess I've learned both in writing the book and in thinking about where I live is that there's always going to be an appeal to move. Um, I think that's, that's just one thing that perhaps as Americans, we, we tend to struggle with those feelings of discontent when perhaps we don't get along with our neighbors or when our house has those inevitable uh, fixes that are difficult to deal with, but there's something truly good and beautiful about sticking in a community that you love despite its difficulties. That doesn't have to be the place where you grew up, but I think we have to ask ourselves more seriously if our communities need us, if there's a sense in which we can be called back, whether there is something that we owe them, something we can do for them, um, or if they have lessons that we can implement in the way we live well and steward the communities we're in currently. And so um, in my own life, I haven't returned home yet. However, I think this book was a very important opportunity for me to think about what it means to stick well and to steward a place and to love it in the midst of its struggles and brokenness and in the midst of your own discontent with it that might pull your heart somewhere else. And how have you, uh, I mean, you went back, I know you interviewed a lot of people, probably friends, family, others still in the community. How do you... Um, because I think what, one of the challenges is that you 
you know, when you move away from a place, um, it's not just you. I think there's a temptation to look back at the place and it's kind of like you're in motion, but the place is sort of stuck in time. But I feel like, you know, you're, you end up changing as well when you're away so that when you come back, you're also a different person and people see you not just as, you know, Gracie Olmstead, but like you're, you know, Gracie Olmstead 10 years down the road and you're different. You, you haven't been there for the last 10 years. So when you're writing about them and I, you know, I think you do a, a wonderful job and you're, you're, you're probably much more gracious than many people would be. But how do you kind of still uphold the humanity of the people you're talking about and not be, I guess, patronizing? Cause I, I could see with, um, you know, other people that I know who've written similar books, you know, Rod Dreher had his book about returning back home. You had JD Vance who has his sort of memoir growing up and, um, you know, uh, north of Cincinnati, and now he, he's actually back there. But how do you wrestle with this challenge of talking publicly about the people that you've personally left behind and doing it in a way that sort of upholds their dignity instead of just looking at them like they're specimen? <laughs> well, I think you have to be there at least enough to see them as human beings um, as opposed to specimens and and to spend some time with them um, I spent a lot of time riding around in a tractor with one of my farmers and just asking him questions. Um, I spent a lot of time sitting with my grandfather and asking him question after question. I visited the Dills Farm, a family in my book, um, three or four separate times and emailed back and forth with them and um, was constantly checking up on them. So it, in many ways, I was I was building relationships over long periods of time, some of which already existed, like with my grandfather, but some I was starting from scratch. And in building those relationships and getting to know people, um, began to see how, as is inevitable with any human person, there's way too much to stereotype. There's too much complexity. There's too much beauty. There's too much um individuality for them to be fit into a box and one thing i've noticed about a lot of books about rural america is that it does seem to see these vast swaths of a huge country as the same and i wanted to write a book that didn't look like other books about rural america because idaho is its own place idaho is its own very big place and this is about one very small town in a very big place um, in a larger region, which we call the Mountain West, which could then fit into a larger region called the Heartland. And so it's very important that a book like Sarah Smarsh's book, Heartland, which is set in Kansas, does not look like my book. And that J.D. Vance's book, which is set in Ohio and Appalachia, does not look like either of our books. And yet when you go to oftentimes an urban audience with these books about rural America, they kind of expect the story to be the same, which always just kind of makes me laugh because there's no way that you could have such a, a wide array of geographic, cultural diversity um, spitting out the same stories. And so I am hopeful that in reading the book, people see that there are, of course, patterns that you can see um, across rural towns. And it's important to point out the patterns so that we can hopefully improve things. But also that in the individual stories, there's there's dignity and there's an attention to the things that make this place special and different and itself. And the people who live there, special and different in themselves. So Gracie, before we, um, before we get over to some of the questions that are coming in from our audience, I wanted to just ask one question that we ask all of our all of our guests here on conservative conversations, and that's a: Do you consider yourself a conservative? And b: What do you what does that mean to you? What do you think that means? Well, there was actually a symposium that Johnny put together for the American Conservative back was it last year or two years ago? Yeah, it was last June. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, about that question, and I think kind of what we envisioned. Um, it meant to be conservative or what we wanted conservatism to be. I can't remember the exact prompt, but I loved that project because 
Um, I have many ways in which I would say I'm, I'm not Republican. I haven't voted Republican in a while. Um, and yet at the same time, when I read Russell Kirk or Edmund Burke or the work of Roger Scruton, there's something that resonates with their words like deep inside my soul. And I think that their vision for preserving the permanent things, for being a good steward, um, for the importance of incrementalism and modesty and subsidiarity, all of these things are things that um, matter deeply to me. And I would say have definitely shaped the ways I view the world. Um, seeing myself as an indebted person um, who has a debt I owe both to the dead and to the unborn um, in this vision of the democracy of the dead that Burke put forth. Uh, that is the reason I wrote this book. And so I would say, yes, I, I do see myself as a conservative. I don't know if my vision for conservative is the same as other conservatives, but perhaps one of the beauties of conservatism is that in its various particularities, there's there's room for um, some different viewpoints, <laughs> including my own. I call it sometimes hippie conservatism. I don't know if that's <laughs> the right nice. definition, but... <laughs> Well, I think you have a very compelling vision, Gracie, and I'm glad we were able to to have you on the show. And uh, let's turn it over, James, to some audience questions. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll quickly note, too, that I'll drop a, um, a link to that article that you wrote for the American Conservative in the show notes for the episode. Um, so this one is from Benjamin, and Benjamin asks... Wouldn't you say that the go far expression embodies more of the hero's journey sense that in order to grow, you must explore outside your home, achieve something, then return home and improve it with your achievement? Hmm. I definitely think it could. And one of the things I talk about in my book is that there's a lot of um, people, sociologists and others who have uh, urged people to be returners to take whatever social and financial capital they've been able to build elsewhere and to plant that back into their home communities in order to serve them well. And in fact, I know one farmer and a businessman in the town next to mine who read a book about that hero's journey and decided that he would leave behind a very successful job at Microsoft and go back home and serve the place where he had grown up. And so I definitely think I can, that that can mean that I think it can even probably just refer to the maturing of an individual that we're always growing in some sense. And in, in a way that also means in our larger life journey, we are going far without necessarily moving the place where we live. Um, however, it's interesting in their book, Hollowing Out the Middle, um, which I refer to in my book, the uh, Nicholas Carr and uh, Maria Kafalas who wrote it, talk about how often school teachers and parents will tell their young people who they see as the most successful, the most bright, that they have to leave, that they need to go away from home in order to achieve something that if they stay, they'll be settling in a bad sense, that they will have achieved less than they should have. And so even though it shouldn't mean that, and I think in many instances, at least in rural America, it often does. Yeah, that's that's like the most common uh, movie trope too, right? Of the um, the like successful high school football player or something, and they're like, "You got to get out of here," you know? Um, yeah, certainly a common thing. Um, we have another question here from from Tony. Tony asks, um, "Does industrial farming reduce the cost of food and thereby help lower income families feed their children?" And I would, I, I'm assuming he's sort of asking that in juxtaposition to your uh, small farming exhortation. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the model as it currently stands is our only option. Um, we currently subsidize sugar, corn, soybeans, and other crops that go into a lot of cheap food production. However, the food that we're growing is incredibly bad for your health overall. And it means that in many places that are food insecure, people struggle with health problems that mean that the cheap food they're eating is not actually cheap. It's resulting in larger problems to their health that are horribly deleterious to our society as a whole. And I think we need to fix those in, in any way we can. Um, it's interesting if you look at a lot of the literature that's come out on this subject, one of the ways that um, industrialized farming gets kind of excused to the world or, or um, shared with the world is this idea that we feed the world, right? Uh, it's a very common term. 
Um, but the Grain Foundation and some others have done research that shows that in a lot of countries, it's actually small scale agriculture that feeds those communities in Africa and elsewhere. India currently is um, experiencing a lot of pushback as farmers there have done their own tractor cades to kind of argue for their own ability to grow what they want to grow without Western agribusiness changing their rhythms because there is a huge push in many parts of the globe for farmers to begin buying their seeds and other products from Western agribusinesses. And a lot of farmers are trying to defend their own local food sovereignty and they're saying, no, we've We've actually cared for our communities over a long period of time. So outside of our bubble in America, I think there are other ways of growing things. Um, Also, there's some uh, reports and studies that have been done that show that small farms have the same or better yields as large farms. It's not necessarily true that quantity results in the highest yields. Um, And it also is true that if you have a smaller farm, it's perhaps easier to grow a diversity of crops that are still cereals, you know, everything from oats to various grains and thus are helping feed people on cheaper, um, cheaper grains. But they're better, again, for the soil. There's more diversity than just growing the same thing over and over and over again. So I think there's just some nuance and, and some possibilities for change that we haven't necessarily um, explored to the degree that we could as a society. Even, you know, our tractors and combines are built at a scale that only fits within one farming model, whereas we could actually arguably build things at a scale that enables us to farm with new technologies and to implement them and to be innovative. But once again, at a scale that kind of complements the fact that we want more people working the land and to be doing it alongside their communities. Hmm. And Gracie, one follow up question to a comment you made. So if the food that we grow isn't feeding the world, I mean, what do the corn and soybeans that we export, what is that going, you know, what, what, what is the product that that's being right. transformed? Well, into? and that's the, uh, that's the other thing that I'm so glad you pointed out because most of what we grow isn't actually food um, in America today. We grow corn for ethanol. Um, we grow corn, which uh, goes into animal feed. So you could say that eventually it goes into actual food production because it's fed to animals that we then eat. But um, there's a lot of literature out there on how when you feed cows corn, um, it results in a whole lot of health problems for them and for us because they were made to eat grass. And and so um, there's also a lot of people who have argued that we only feed cows corn because the government subsidizes the mass production of corn and it's got to go somewhere. So it goes into um, corn syrup and it goes into building materials and it goes into ethanol and it goes into what cows eat, but it's not necessarily cattle, not just cows, cows, a female, a female um, animal, but you know <laughs> what I mean? Um, it's, it's, a system that's built around growing things that we aren't actually eating, or maybe it eventually gets to us in the form of food, but we're not growing tons of food on these acres. So we have another question here from Jack, and he asks, what effect will uh, coronavirus and specifically the resulting working remote have on people moving home? Or do you think that this um, could be good for communities? I think it could be. I wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal that explores Um, the trend of young people moving home. And um, some of that is specific to the pandemic itself. Some of it was prior to that. Prior to that, what you saw was that in counties of less than 250,000, there was an influx of people that met or surpassed um, in most years the the outflow of people. Um, So even though they were still experiencing out-migration, they were actually experiencing a sizable amount of in-migration And there's plenty of anecdotal data to suggest that a lot of those people were returners, people moving back home to the communities where they grew up. In uh, 2020 specifically, what you saw was a mass movement of young people home, I think between the ages of 18 and 29, um, to the degree that it was the most young people living at home in their home communities since the Great Depression. Now, some of those people moved home because colleges were closed or for other similar reasons. Maybe rent was so expensive they moved into their parents' basement. All of that said, 
there have to be at least a few of those young people who realize they like being home, they like being reintegrated back into that community, and they decide to stay there. And there's a lot of rural towns from the research I've done that see that they are um, experiencing something important and they're trying to capitalize on it. They're trying to expand rural broadband. They're trying to revitalize their downtowns. They're trying to do whatever they can to get these people who've moved home to stay home. And so I'm really, I'm really excited about that possibility. I do think that uh, what we're doing right now over a computer is not as connected. Um, it is to some extent dismembered from actual physical proximity and love and community. And so there's a sense in which working from home has its downsides. But insofar as it allows you to really integrate into your home community, not just not just the town or the city where you live, but really to make home your base. I think that's a, a very valuable and important thing. And I'm glad that maybe more Americans will get to do it. Great. And uh, on that note, I um, it's about time to wrap up. I did um, drop that Wall Street Journal article into the Q&A section if anyone wants to read it. Uh, funny note, before earlier today when James and I were talking about this interview, I said, oh, there's a great article in the Wall Street Journal about these people moving back home. And I literally almost referenced it. And then I did not know that you were the one that wrote it. So <laughs> well done. And I encourage everyone to read it. Thank you. Um, so I'll also put it in the show notes for the episode. Yeah. Um, on that note, uh, Gracie, thanks for joining us today. Uh, if people are interested in seeing more of your work besides uh, purchasing a copy of uh, unrooted on hopefully somewhere other than Amazon. Although if Amazon's the only place uh, they decide to buy it, that's better than that's better than nothing. So where else can people uh, find your work, Gracie? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Gracie Olmstead, Gracie with a Y, G R A C Y. Um, I'm also on Instagram these days at Gracie Writes, and I'm on Facebook at Gracie Olmstead. So um, since I'm a freelancer, I write a lot for a various kind of uh, different publications. And so I try to updo update those accounts with whatever's, whatever's new, whatever's fresh. Awesome. Thank you again for joining us, Gracie. And upcoming on Conservative Conversations, be on the lookout for episodes of Dr. R.J. Snell, editor of the Public Discourse, and Michael Matheson Miller of the Acton Institute. Thanks for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to head over to isi.org backslash resources to see all of the other things we offer to our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Modern Age, ISI Books, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening and don't forget to rate and review. We'll see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.